though most fall into beta canon, Star Trek fans have no shortage of reference materials for their favorite shows. And today we're going to look at some of my favorite Starship designs that originated from beta canon to become full-fledged members of Alpha Canon. Hello and welcome to Truth or Myth, a Star Trek web series that takes a look at the truth, or canon information, to dispel the myths that have surfaced on any given topic. In today's video, we're taking a look at the Starship designs from the Franz Joseph Technical Manual to better understand their place in Star Trek history. When I was a kid and ran across Star Trek, the original series of course, I was mesmerized. I loved the way it sparked my imagination, and immediately I wanted to devour any and all information I could about the show. Heading down to the public library, yes, this was before the internet as we know it today, I borrowed two Star Trek books. The first being the Star Trek Compendium, original edition hardcover, that I would buy several years later at that particular library's yard sale, and the second being the Starfleet Technical Manual by Franz Joseph. This manual was filled with original series information, everything from uniforms to the internal workings of bridge consoles. This manual even had the Articles of the Federation. I read that thing from cover to cover over and over again. And a few years later, I would end up buying my own copy, the copy I'm using for this video actually. You see, as I've often said, I love the original series, but that being said, there is a serious lack of Starship classes shown within it. In fact, the original run showed basically none. We saw a few other Constitution classes, sure, but that was about it. Even my child brain knew there must be more classes to Starfleet than just the Constitution class. And for me, this tech manual filled in that void rather nicely. Franz Joseph was able to take the design of the Constitution class and create a bunch of new classes that meld seamlessly into the Star Trek universe. So seamlessly, actually, that many of the Star Trek movies and even Star Trek Discovery would use the manual as a reference, and as such, would make much about what is in this work of fiction, canon. When I originally made this video early in my channel's career, I had yet to find my voice or writing style, but like a trooper I went ahead and cobbled together that video. I had no access to 3D models for most of the classes back in the day. But now, having Space Engine and with me porting starships into that wonderful program for use in these videos, along with the great 3D modelers having already included some of them in that add-on, I'm able to give you the full Monty, so to speak, on these amazing designs. So now we'll dive into each of the separate classes and the information provided about them. Okay, so the Constitution class itself wasn't a Joseph design, being created by the great Matt Jeffries. But it was the class that Joseph started from, and the information provided about the class in his manual would become canon in various screen displays throughout Star Trek's run. The Constitution class is 288.6 meters long, with a width of 127.1 meters. The standard ship's complement for the class was 43 command level officers and 387 crew members. These numbers, of course, fluctuated depending on mission-specific requirements like transport duty. Classified as a heavy cruiser, this class had a maximum safe cruising speed of warp factor 6, with an emergency speed of warp factor 8. Tactically, it was equipped with three phaser banks, each included two emitters, and two photon torpedo launchers. The class itself had an 18-year lifespan of service before it needed to be refit or decommissioned altogether. On the back of this class's page is a listing of all the starships of the class commissioned by Starfleet, including their registries. And let me tell you, there are a lot.
going against the imaginary rule of always having even-numbered nacelles on a ship, the Saladin class would basically be a saucer section, which connected via a neck to a single warp nacelle. The Saladin class is 242.5 meters long, with a width of 127.1 meters. The standard ship's complement for this class was 20 command level officers and 180 crew members. Classified as a destroyer, this class had a maximum safe cruising speed of warp factor 6, with an emergency speed of warp factor 8. Tactically, it was equipped with three phaser banks, each included two emitters, and two photon torpedo launchers. The class had a lifespan of nine years of service before it needed to be put in for refit or decommissioning. It should be noted that this class is in fact canon, though the information about it sadly is not. If you look closely in Star Trek II and Star Trek III, you can actually see this class on display monitors being looped on consoles throughout the bridge. Virtually identical in look and shape to that of the Saladin class, the Hermes class was classified as a scout vessel. This class is also 242.5 meters long, with a width of 127.1 meters. But the standard ship's complement for the class was 20 command level officers and only 175 crew members, as opposed to the Saladin's 180 crew members. I'm not sure what the extra five officers did on the Saladin class, but I'm sure whatever it was, was important to that class's mission profile. Having a maximum safe cruising speed of warp factor 6 and an emergency speed of warp factor 8, this design was Joseph's answer to a pure Starfleet scientific vessel. Tactically, this class was far less equipped than its virtual twin, having only one phaser bank with two emitters and no photon torpedo launchers. This class also had a lifespan of nine years of service before it needed to be put in for refit or decommissioning. Once again, this class is canon, as it can also be seen in the early Star Trek movies scrolling past the audience on bridge displays. But the information for it again is sadly not. This is a class I've always found very interesting. In a lot of ways, it looks like a Miranda-class vessel, but since it's classified as a transport tug, it serves a unique function. Having a tow pad at the bottom of its neck allows this ship to connect transport containers to its hull. These containers would then be hauled around the Federation to their various destinations. The containers come in a variety of designs, one for products like machine parts or clothing or other smaller cargo, one for refrigerated goods, one for dry bulk products like Quadratriticali, which would be stored in large vertical bins, one for liquids, again stored in special cube bins, and lastly, one for personnel transport. I guess what I've always loved about this design is that it makes sense. Starfleet is constantly having to freight around supplies to colonies and is always trading with other worlds. So a ship dedicated to this mission profile just hits the right notes for me. This class, without the pod, is 222 meters long, with a width of 127.1 meters. Its standard ship's complement was 22 command level officers and 198 crew members. Again, having a maximum safe cruising speed of warp factor 6, with an emergency speed of warp factor 8, tactically, this class was equipped with two phaser banks, with two emitters each, and no photon torpedo launchers. This class also had a lifespan of nine years in service, before it needed to be put in for refit or decommissioning. And surprise, this class is also officially canon as while analyzing frame-by-frame -frame bridge panel readouts from the early Star Trek movies, the Ptolemy class can be seen for a split second, though again, the information on this class would not be canon.
What never made sense to me in Star Trek was the lack of visual evidence that Starfleet had any dedicated warships. Now I know it's a peaceful exploratory organization, but they have to be able to protect their space and Federation citizens from, say, giant amoebas and return to home space probes. Yet all the visual evidence in canon we have seems to suggest that the heavy cruiser is as far as Starfleet will go, at least in the prime timeline and up until the Borg attack at Wolf 359. But Joseph thought the same way I did and created the Federation class. Classified as a dreadnought, this class was designed by Starfleet to be fast and powerful. In fact, much of fandom would come to know this class as simply the Dreadnought class. Having three warp nacelles, this class had a standard safe cruising speed of warp factor 8 and an emergency speed of warp factor 10. This class stood at 320 meters in length with a width of 140 meters. Its standard crew complement was that of 55 command level officers and 445 crew members. Tactically, this class was equipped with five phaser banks with two emitters each and two photon torpedo launchers. A few interesting components of this design was the inclusion of a shuttle bay in the front of the ship just above the main deflector dish. As to whether this design is canon or not has been a long time debate. You see, Star Trek The Motion Picture used Joseph's tech manual as a reference throughout the film. During the first scene with comm station Epsilon 9, the starships named and their registry numbers heard in the background are straight out of his manual. In most releases of TMP though, much of the underlying dialogue is simply muffled and cannot be heard. However, on my Laserdisc version of the movie, it can be, and one line in particular may lend credence to this class actually being canon. In the movie, there is a Starfleet officer calling in from the dreadnought USS Entante, NCC-2120, another direct reference to the manual that we as fans can cling on to. And in remaking this video, I took another gander at the older Trek movies to see if I could get a glimpse of the Dreadnought Federation class. And going frame by frame, there were two things that happened to me. One, I got a severe headache, and two, I wasn't able to find it. But if any of you good trinaries out there have found it and can point me to the scene in time, I'd be eternally grateful to finally put this argument to rest for all of fandom. But for now, the Federation Dreadnought class's canon status is still very much up for debate. It's amazing how much we as fans hunger for Star Trek Starship designs. I've discussed and debated different ones with all of you over the past few years of this channel's lifetime. And although this video is a bit of an unusual departure from my normal videos, I thought you'd all enjoy the break. Lastly, I just wanted to give a personal thank you to Karen, the daughter of Franz Joseph. When I originally made this video, she took the time to thank me for it and to explain and put into perspective her father's work. That's something that touched me very deeply. Being her father's work meant so much to me growing up. So I hope, if she is still watching this channel, that version 2.0 means just as much to her as the original did. Sadly, Franz Joseph passed away on June 2nd, 1994, so I never got to thank him for the inspiration he's given me throughout all these years. But I hope, wherever in the cosmos he is now, that he's enjoyed this video. Also, I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into my childhood imagination and can appreciate as much as I do, the hard work and talent of Franz Joseph. He will never be forgotten. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth. What do you think of the Joseph designs? How do you feel about me stepping outside the cannon box? Would you like to see more videos like this one? 
well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel to continue to boldly go? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.